Stanley Kubrick, really good at chess, always challenging boundaries, master manipulator, king of trolls, and probably the greatest film director to ever live. You know, just, just throwing that one in. Despite only directing 13 films, yep, 13, the majority of his works are across the board considered classics or masterpieces. Four of them made it into the American Film Institute's 100 Greatest American Films of All Time. Roger Ebert included six in his collection of great movies, and as of recording this audio track, seven sit in IMDb's Top 250. Collectively, Kubrick's films were nominated for 24 Academy Awards. Also, his legendary facial hair was spotlighted as the 13th of June 2015's Beard of the Day on the TheCommittedIndian.com. Sometimes I disagree with snarky old critics, but this time we've come to the same conclusion. Kubrick's body of work is truly something to admire, and provides additional value in the variety of film genres it contains. Naturally, the director's work has been analyzed to death, but here I aim to throw in my two cents and and cite some of the interesting observations I've found in my research. So yeah, I've seen all 13 of Kubrick's feature-length films, many of them more than once. Anything less would have been unfair in discussing his work in terms of best and worst. It's also only right to make a list like this if a body of work is defined and complete. Don't expect a Christopher Nolan top 10 anytime soon. If I made one, I'd have to redo the whole thing when that World War II movie drops. For clarification, this isn't a list in the order of my personal favorites. I've tried to be as objective as possible possible in my selections, putting movies higher up the list that represent what I'd call great, rather than those I have a personal connection with. But don't expect no watch mojo bullshit here, some of my choices may surprise. Emphasis here on that I have mostly good things to say about Kubrick's fourth worst movie. We're not into masterpiece territory yet, but some directors make a dozen films without delivering something of this standard. While Olita is certainly dull at times and provides a weaker conclusion than an opening, it's remarkably well made, and offers plenty of intriguing content. Even today, the relationship between the professor and a young girl feels taboo, and Peter Sellers rocks every scene he's in. I said to myself when I saw you, I said, that's a guy with the most normal looking face I ever saw in my life. That's very nice of you to see, eh? Not a bit, not a bit. It's great to see a normal face, because I'm a normal guy. It'd be great for two normal guys like us to get together and talk about world events, you know, in a normal sort of way. Plus, the movie lets expecting mothers know that drinking alcohol while pregnant is fine. Some of that foreign beer, I'm Wait, sure you like what, what, it. No, stop. Sure, huh? No, s s haven't you heard of fetal alcohol syndrome? More than just an important film for paving the way to Sellers' role in in some other movie, and tackling forbidden themes, Lolita is well executed and contains flashes of brilliance. Uh, okay, in fighting an uphill battle here, uh, I'm about to overcompensate a little bit and say some negative things about The Shining, which I stand by, but that's a dangerous thing to do on the internet. So two things, uh, one, I just wanted to let you guys know so that you could have your mice centered on the dislike button. And two, uh, The Shining, it's a pretty good movie. I mean, I wouldn't have it in this list if it wasn't. So let's get off on the right foot. The Shining, I recommend it. It's a good movie. But now that we've got that out of the way, the Shining isn't as good a movie as it's made out to be. It's beautifully shot, well acted, and masterfully directed, but the movie's still a shining example of a film receiving inflated praise because of the artist's other work. Now, I don't want to be that guy who ignorantly claims, The book was better. I prefer the book. The only people that liked the movie are those who didn't read the book. Books, 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 books. But I will say that many of the changes from the source material were unfortunate. The Stephen King version of The Shining, directed by Stanley Kubrick, is better than the Stanley Kubrick version of The Shining, directed by Stanley Kubrick. And that's not to say that Stanley Kubrick's vision for the film is poor by any stretch, just maybe that he needed to commit to it a little bit more, because the finished product feels like this odd hybrid between what Stanley Kubrick wanted for the project and what Stephen King wanted and there's a lot of half-baked elements from each that don't really resolve themselves. So what I'm really trying to say is the movie feels like it had too many cooks in the kitchen. And while I agree that the film is kind of scary when you sit back and think about it, in a world where we've survived horror films directed by the likes of James Wan, I'm simply not all that frightened by what's on screen. 
Hell, 2001 freaked me out significantly more than this movie. It's fundamentally a near masterpiece, Jack's Descent into Madness is well handled, and I'd even call The Shining a great horror movie. But that's a rather low standard, and people give this movie extra credit for its alleged symbolism. I give some legitimacy to theories that The Shining references the genocide of Native Americans. Intentional references to such are abundant and a clear deviation from the novel. The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. Some continuity mistakes may have been intentional to subliminally make the hotel feel haunted. But then again, they may just be plain old continuity mistakes. And likewise, the layout of the Overlook Hotel is impossible. But this could easily have been something the filmmakers just weren't overly concerned with. The Shining is not an economic satire, proof that Kubrick helped the government fake the moon landing, or filled with Illuminati symbolism. And this poster is definitely just a skier. I got the skiing poster and my eye is drawn to it and I realize that's not a skier. That's a, that's a minotaur. It just leaped out at me. I understand that whether or not something was intentional doesn't stifle its potential to have meaning, but people act like Kubrick was incapable of shooting a scene without grand subliminal purpose. I guess this helicopter shadow has meaning yet to be discerned. And don't forget about that haunted sandwich. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy the Blu-ray triple feature, but in my opinion, The Shining can't compete with Kubrick's top tier work. The first half of Full Metal Jacket is perfect. The camera work, Lee Ermey's hilarious improv, the sexual metaphors, all A plus material. But I agree with the consensus that the film falters after its jarring shift of subject. In the second half, Full Metal Jacket wanders without much purpose and fails to make use of anything established in the first 45 minutes. The cinematography is still excellent and it's fair to say there are some good ideas floating around in part two, but no one I'm aware of has successfully connected the dots to form a consistent theme out Outside, Vietnam sucked. I like the irony of Born to Kill scrawled on the helmet of a soldier who also sports a peace sign, but in pointing it out I feel it loses its sense of cleverness, and likewise most of the latter portion of the film falls flat. However, I repeat, the first part of this movie is excellent and remarkably self-contained. For this reason, I see no issue in checking the movie out only to appreciate the first of a pair of short films about the war in Vietnam. wide shut. Good movie. Kubrick supposedly considered this his greatest contribution to film, which, um, you seen your own movies, dude? And it boasts the work of a genius director with several films under his belt. So yeah, the direction is really, really on point, and shock value is well used to convey the film's message and themes. I like the matter-of-factness with which the intense graphic nudity is handled, and the orgy sequence is a legitimate trip. Also, Tom Cruise's horror fantasies are especially effective. People say Kubrick grew colder with his later projects, but I rebuke that view when calling this one of the director's most human films. For crying out loud, it's about the challenge of a couple remaining faithful to one another. The movie's lighting and choreography are good enough on their own to merit a viewing of this film. And the movie has a very distinct feeling to it, like a complimentary blend of old school and new school filmmaking. Not nearly enough people have treated themselves to this classic heist movie. That's right, Stanley Kubrick directed a heist movie. And it's awesome. The Killing is an earlier film than most on this list, but what it lacks in grand themes it makes up for in consumability and style. It contains all the elements you'd expect in a traditional heist movie, the crew, the setup, winding tension, building up as the gears start turning, and one little detail with the potential to cripple the entire operation. But all these cliches are handled with utmost skill and elevated by solid acting, good direction, and great editing. Kubrick employs some nice repetition of scenes to keep the timeline straight and perfectly balances the complexity of the job between going over our heads and being too simple to get wrapped up in. Sometimes you don't want an epic message about the state of humanity woven into your entertainment, and The Killing is a perfect choice for that mood. It's clever and very well executed, making for an especially intense first viewing. So check it out, buy the Criterion Collection Blu-ray, it's great! Many movie fans envision Barry Lyndon as a really well shot film with stuffy costumes and a dull plot. Incorporate a three hour runtime and you've got a flick that hangs out at the end of the watch list for years. 
In reality, Barry Lyndon's more like a Martin Scorsese movie directed by Stanley Kubrick. So just think like 18th century Wolf of Wall Street with Stanley Kubrick visuals. Then look me in the eye and tell me that's something you don't want to see. Ambitious by any standard, it's got a rise from rags to riches, female objectification, violence, deception, corruption, tragedy, and a kick-ass plot with a mind of its own. Include Amadeus-level set and costume design with incredible cinematography, and you've got the recipe for one technically delicious film. The duels are some of the best scenes Kubrick ever directed, and aside from some ill-fitting narration and overuse of music, Barry Lyndon easily holds its own among Kubrick's other masterpieces. Roger Ebert's great movie review of this film is one of the best in the series, so for further persuasion as to the genius of Barry Lyndon, I recommend checking it out. There are dozens of strategies to making a good movie. While Kubrick is notorious for his introspective films that employ symbolism and grand themes, in his early years he had success with more traditionally entertaining movies that generally involved a greater sense of humanity. Paths of Glory is the greatest effort from that Kubrick. Either this, The Killing, or maybe the next movie on this list are the best introduction to the director, and depending on the mood, accessibility can be a plus. But with this movie, you retain some solid visuals and a story that invites contemplation. Paths of Glory is rare in that I'm confident any viewer can have an emotional experience with this one way or another. How the events are portrayed doesn't assert sentiment so much as it provides an environment for it to flourish. The stark black and white and bleak environment set a tone that's consistent and assists the film's well-articulated anti-war message. Furthermore, the ending is beautiful and something you might not expect to fit so well until you've seen it. And now it's time for an intermission of sorts, where I discuss the films Kubrick directed that didn't make the cut. There's only three, so I'm gonna briefly share my opinion of each. Hmm, some people might be surprised at Spartacus's non-placement in my top 10. And sure, it's a pretty good movie. The production value is high, Charles Lawton is great, and the I Am Spartacus scene is brilliant. But between these shining moments, we have three hours of mixed material that makes for a boring movie that lacks Kubrick's signature level of creativity. If this was a top 11 video, Spartacus would deserve a slot. It's worth a watch, especially for fans of movies like Ben-Hur, Lawrence of Arabia, and The Ten Commandments. But the movie's unworthy of its classic masterpiece status. Killer's Kiss is a pretty generic movie that would have faded without Kubrick's later success. It has its moments, there are some nice shots, and that Kubrick was able to effectively wear so many hats testifies to his talent, but it's dull and lacks any sort of X factor, which I feel was the key to the success of his other films. While most of his movies are cool, unique, or straight up wacky, there's really nothing remarkable about Killer's Kiss. Most people are blissfully unaware of Kubrick's first feature length, Escapade. Because the director was committed to destroying every last copy. Unfortunately, he did not succeed, and the movie is still available for viewing if one commits themselves to seeking it out. Fear and Desire is the Star Wars holiday special of the Stanley Kubrick catalog. In a word, it's clunky. The production value is at rock bottom, the pace is dreadfully uneven, and there's hardly a well-delivered line to be found. I wouldn't call the film incoherent, but every aspect lacks the maturity that was abundant in the director's later work. And Kubrick was pretty cool about it. The guy realized that his first work was poor and acknowledged it as a learning experience. I, I, I didn't really know what I didn't know, and I thought, well, I wasn't satisfied to just uh, make a, a, you know, an interesting film. I wanted it to be a very poetic and... Uh, meaningful film, and it was a little bit like the Thurber story about the midget, you know, who wouldn't take the base on balls, <laughs> and decided to swing, you know? But there's little reason to check out this film, unless you're making a top 10 Stanley Kubrick movies list, or you have the opportunity to show it to one of the interviewees for Room 237. That's a minotaur. Strange Love is a thinking man's comedy, an intelligent satire, and one of the all-time greatest films. Reminder that we're at number three here. Comedy is inherently viewed as a lesser genre. The films that it's attributed to make us laugh, then they end and they fade from memory. But in Strange Love, Kubrick employs humor as a tool to lighten the mood around serious issues, and despite the enjoyable irony ever present, this is still a very serious film. Often humor is used as an expression of pain. We laugh so as not to break down and cry. For an illustration of this point, I cite the wise sage Jim Gaffigan. Four kids. 
four kids. If you want to know what it's like to have a fourth, just imagine you're drowning, and then someone hands you a baby. The good news is we live in a two-bedroom apartment, so I thought it through. I haven't slept in seven years. People are laughing, but Jim could just as well be talking to his shrink. The goofy voice and exaggerations take something tragic and warp it into lighthearted comedy. But the message that parenting's a bitch still gets through. This is the assumption Strangelove operates on, and it plays out marvelously. The film wasn't commissioned as a comedy, and some sources say Slim Pickens didn't even know what kind of movie he was in until he actually saw it. So the choice of genre was deliberate, and all the better for the movie. I mean, imagine if this was a pure drama. The final product would be a bleak tragedy with relatively dull performances and certainly leave a bad aftertaste. Strangelove uses humor in possibly the most appropriate way. Needless to say, this movie is hilarious. Peter Sellers is amazing. The script is perfect. The film should have won all the Oscars back in 1965. Throughout Strangelove, dozens of government and military shortcomings are exploited from the vices each of Sellers' characters exhibit to others mistaking personal issues as relevant to professional decisions. I'm gonna get your money for you. But if you don't get the President of the United States on that phone, you know what's going to happen to you? What? You're going to have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. In this vein, I think it's appropriate to point out that the whole movie's a sexual metaphor. <laughs> that, that's impossible, Mr. Brett. I mean, uh... Uh, look at the big board. I wouldn't have recognized this on my own, but many others have drawn parallels that kind of make sense, and Kubrick pretty much confirmed the existence of such themes by responding to a fan letter regarding them. I'm not going to outline the entire metaphor here, because one, it's a little uncomfortable, two, I'm not exactly in love with the theory, and three, others have covered it in detail. So I'll put a link in the description to a couple articles, but leave it up to each viewer to pursue this bizarre parallel based on level of interest. But sex aside, Strangelove still has some great commentary on things like the lunacy of mutual assured destruction, the bloated nature of politics, and the government's inability to adapt to unique circumstances. <laughs> 2001 A Space Odyssey isn't a movie, it's an experience. Fit with awesome visuals, little plot, and unique lulls designed to let the viewer appreciate the sheer majesty of the film while watching the film, this is an incredibly ambitious flick. From an aesthetic standpoint, it's beautiful, and the movie has aged incredibly well, when you recognize that a full image of an illuminated Earth wouldn't be taken until four years after 2001's release, the visuals are all the more impressive. But you don't have to attribute an age handicap. With a couple filters, one could easily intercut this film with 2014's Interstellar. Great science fiction is typically about either adventure or ideas, and while 2001 has elements of the first, it's a true king of the second. From the exploration of man's relationship with technology to humanity's destiny, this film is full of big themes that are remarkably well handled. However, a disclaimer is appropriate. 2001 A Space Odyssey isn't a movie for everybody. Calling it a weak film in most any way, shape, or form is absurd, because it's an objectively fantastic work of art. But I completely get it if you can't enjoy yourself because the movie is so boring. That said, theories on the meaning behind this film are awesome, and if you're a certain kind of movie nerd, a quality discussion on 2001 can rival the enjoyment of watching the dimensional transit scene on LSD. There's nothing quite like A Clockwork Orange, both in its mainstream popularity despite explicit content and the bizarre world to which it provides a window. I suspect the key to this film's greatness lies in how interesting the film is as a whole. From the NADSAT speech to the bizarre fashion to the fucked up content, Clockwork oozes X-Factor, distinguishing itself from most any other film. And this jives with Kubrick's practice of asserting interesting ideas and themes through masterful filmmaking that's easy to appreciate and enjoy. To this end, the novel's core ideas of free will, true good and evil, and perversion translate well. But the seriousness of its themes isn't quite as well conveyed without Kubrick's shocking visuals to back it up. In adapting Clockwork, the director walked a fine line between making our anti-hero too likable and thus condoning his behavior, and sacrificing charisma, which would doom the movie to be lost to history. This is why the gratuitous nudity and violence is essential to the film. 
By simultaneously striving to make the film as entertaining and appalling as possible, the audience is willing to sit through the show, enjoying themselves, but I can't imagine the devil himself condoning Alex's behavior throughout the first act. The film's biggest criticism comes in that it's purely disgusting, but as I've outlined, the movie is little without this element. We're not talking about the 120 days of Sodom or the human centipede here. The explicit content serves a definite purpose and Clockwork's message is all the more profound for it. Themes aside, Clockwork has solid camera work, stellar writing, excellent costume design, a fantastic portrayal of an intriguing character, and one of the greatest musical scores ever put to use. The soundtrack is so good in fact I made a point to track down a copy on vinyl. Credit is due to Wendy Carlos, who prior to her work on Clockwork and The Shining developed Switched on Bach, which despite being obnoxious and dated is a landmark album from the 60s that pioneered the use of the electronic synthesizer. Basically it's a bunch of classical Bach made to sound electronic, which was met upon its release with negative comments about making the composer's beautiful music sound highly unnatural. But given Clockwork's core theme of perversion and true horror and warping something wholesome, this is exactly who you want behind the score. Alex wearing the typically pure white but acting anything but pure, his views on sex and traditionally harmless milk containing drugs all parallel the unnatural procedure Alex undergoes in the same way the film's score was intended to distort something wholesome. To satisfy this agenda, some of the music's tempo was meddled with to the point of discomfort and an electronic synthesizer was used. But beyond the meaning behind the score's artistic deviance, it still sounds amazing. In fact, most of Kubrick's musical commissions and selections are great. The Shining score is spooky, Linden's is majestic, and 2001's provides an ultra-classy atmosphere. The director frequently employed ironic music at the conclusion of a film, which produces a neat effect. When such soundtrack visual dissonance is introduced, an audience gains a better grasp on the situation. By realizing that the chances of meeting again are very slim after the events of Dr. Strangelove, one recognizes the situation more fully. But that's not to say the musical choices don't add anything to their respective films. It's about sex! Similar tactics are used in Paths of Glory and Full Metal Jacket. So what else is to be learned from Kubrick's body of work as a whole? What makes this guy's movie so great? Well, I've already mentioned the first trend. X Factor and or uniqueness. There are probably dozens of forgotten movies that comment on the absurdity of the Cold War or depict delinquent violence in an effort to convey some message. But Strangelove is remembered because it's hilarious and Clockwork has stuck around because of its backwards way of speech and cosplay potential. I'm not saying this is the only reason Kubrick's movies were successful, but looking back, most all of his flicks have something peculiar about them. Finding another movie like Barry Lyndon, The Shining, or Eyes Wide Shut is difficult because there's really nothing quite like them, and people respond positively to seeing new things. Flawless fundamentals. In this video I use the word perfect a lot more than I typically like to, but it's the only way to accurately describe many elements of Kubrick's movies. If the contrast between fear and desire and paths of glory can teach us anything, it's that getting the basics down changes everything. Many of the filmmakers' works tackle major themes like the destiny of man or the nature of good and evil, and without meticulous craftsmanship behind them, they wouldn't feel like they earned the right to acknowledge such enormous concepts. Therefore, slow and steady wins the race. There was a 12-year gap between Full Metal Jacket and Eyes Wide Shut. Honestly, most filmmakers don't have the luxury of extending their deadlines all that far, but the message is, you can't rush perfection. Little details make a difference, and that tiny bit of extra effort is probably worth it. And that's Kubrick. If you enjoyed this video or found it informative, please hit that like and or share button because it really is appreciated. Hey, sorry to interrupt that, but gotta point you in the direction of Rob Agger before we close up shop here. Because this guy is the Kubrick king as far as theories and ideas behind the meaning of Kubrick's films go. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, definitely check out this guy over on his channel as well as on the channel of Learning. Uh, sometimes he stretches things a little bit far, but it's all very interesting. So check it out, and of course, links down below. But now back to the conclusion. It really is appreciated. Thanks for watching this video. Go ahead and leave your thoughts on the films discussed or the video itself in the comments below, and have a good one. New updates on the binge weekly through the Cinebinge channel or the website, but for now, I'm afraid this is.